We're on Fisher's Road to Reykjavik and the candidates final in 1971 against Petrosian, Fisher Petrosian. So this is the ninth game and Fisher had just won three games in a row. First five games, well, it was even, but Fisher had just taken control of the match and with four games to go, well, perhaps uh, Petrosian needed a miracle if he was gonna come back. Nevertheless, interesting to see how he reacted in this ninth game. Would he fight strongly or would he fade out? Let's take a look. Fisher with the white pieces. And Petrosian plays the French. Okay. He's played the Sicilian in game seven without success. And Fisher shows that he's ready for a winner. But Petrosian does something a little bit different. He plays knight c6. Now, if Fischer closes the position with e5, and actually I think that's the way to try to beat this system, then you get a tense maneuvering kind of position. And well, I think Petrosian was very comfortable in those positions. Um, so it's an interesting choice from Petrosian. But Fischer, I think, reacts very sensibly. He just plays the knight to f3, just holding the tension. And Petrosian plays knight f6 once again, tempting white into pushing with e5, which again, I think is the way to try to um, get some advantage. But well, in the match situation, Fischer just could play very simply. And he exchanged pawns on d5. So now we get a kind of French exchange variation with the slight difference that all the knights have been developed. In particular, these knights here are a little bit unusual. And that perhaps gives white some chance of the advantage after this pin. You know, you might be able to get some initiative with knight e5. Now Petrosian plays the bishop out to g4 here, and I don't think that's the best move. In fact, bishop b4, just copying white, I think is actually okay for black. It's actually very hard to prove an advantage for white. This line was actually quite popular in Germany in the 1980s. Uh, Gerhard Hertneck, for example, defeated Nigel Short with this in Dortmund 86. And Short then went on to use this himself, defeating Korchnoi in Reykjavik 87. There's more to this than meets the eye, actually. And as I said, it's hard to prove an advantage for white. But Petrosian plays bishop g4, which I have to say I'm not particularly keen on, because after this move, very simple move from Fischer, if the bishop retreats to h5, then white can play g4, knight e5, and take control, take the initiative. So Petrosian exchanged on f3. But they just, this just brings white's queen out to a really nice square. It's not in any way vulnerable on f3. Uh, and looks here, looks down here, might shift to g3. Just a great square for the queen. So already I like Fischer's position. And there's pressure here, you know, could be some kind of threat to take on d5. But here, again, Petrosian has a kind of clear choice. Um, and I think he compromised. He backed down and made life very easy for Fischer. He played a6. We'll look at that in a second. That's the game continuation. <clears throat> I think he could have kept more tension by castling kingside. Now, white could castle queenside and perhaps we're already threatening to take here and take here. But if black makes a clever move here, knight d7, then actually things aren't so simple. And white could exchange and play this quite simply. I mean, certainly white is in no danger here, but black neither. Um, if white wants to be ambitious, you could drop the bishop, keep the two bishops. But then this knight switches over here, defends this. Later on, might have a chance to hop in here, you never know. White is better, but black keeps some tension in the game. At least the kings are on opposite sides of the board, which, you know, that could lead to something later on. 
But the game continuation, this just leaves white in a very pleasant situation. Because a6 basically just wastes the tempo. Fischer wants to exchange there. Now, I suppose you could say that the advantage of playing like this for black is that this pawn is now protected. There's no danger there. But white is ahead in development. Gets the rook to the e file. There's pressure here. I mean, you can see all white's pieces <clears throat> look good here. Um, and the pawn structure on the queen side, well, that is really unattractive. And we can see in a second how Fisher exploits that. Bishop dropped to h4. I think really the only way of trying to relieve the pressure on black's position is to play rook e8 here and try to exchange pieces with knight e4. But even this isn't great. I mean, this was recommended afterwards by some commentators. And this is the best that black has to go on a counterattack like this. But actually, well, this isn't, it's sort of winning a pawn, but black can strike back by taking um, two rooks against the queen. And the rook goes back and protects this pawn. So it's a material balance of queen and a pawn against two rooks. And normally, well, you'd think the rooks would be okay there, but this is a strong move. Threatening to come down to b7, and probably another pawn is going to drop. White is simply better here. Very good winning chances. So that was a long way of saying that black really doesn't have a lot of counterplay here. It's, and it's very hard to, to shake off white's pressure. Basically, we're in a situation where there are only two results possible, as they say. Either Fischer's going to win this or Petrosian will draw, but Petrosian really has no winning chances in this position at all. And this is such a typical Fischer position. He likes clarity. He likes clear plans. And this is very simple for him to play when it's really strategic. That's the kind of position that he loved. So first of all, Fischer takes control on the queen side. So he's ready to support this knight coming here. And these pawns are absolutely rock solid. Um, if rook e8 is trying to sort of exchange pieces to sort of minimize the damage, relief some pressure, simply knight a4, and this is great for white. Let's go back. Rook b8 played. Knight a4, really simple. Now Fischer, uh, excuse me, Petrosian does manage to exchange these bishops. And that blocks the e-file, of course. So what do we do? Really simple, we get rid of the knight. How do we do it? Shift the queen, move up the pawn to f3. So queen f4, very simple, threatening f3, and then rook invasion. Um, so queen d6. So Petrosian exchanges queens, and now he plays pawn takes queen here. What about knight takes? Well, here we can see black's problems if he plays normally. So the rook would invade. Defending passively is horrible. Okay, so what happens? You exchange all the pieces. So this rook here is pinned, can't move away. But white can exchange all the pieces here. Is this good enough for black to draw? Absolutely not. Now we can see the strength of this knight hop. The knight already threatens to come in here to take the pawn here. In fact, all black's queenside pawns are weak. Okay, that just prevents the knight coming here. Well, all is an exaggeration, these three. So the knight threatens the pawn, the knight goes back, the knight comes to b8, threatening here and here. Winning a pawn, basically, at least. Tremendous position for white. So going back, Petrosian, this is Petrosian's idea. He exchanged queens, and at least this stops the knight coming in c5. And you think, well, this looks like quite a big improvement. But basically, Fisher 
has just switched his advantage here. He's now able to hammer down the sea file and actually damage Black's pawns as well. So obviously pawn takes pawn, can be met by rook takes knight. So the knight drops and now rook c1. Simple idea, if pawn takes pawn, rook takes, and the pawn on c6 will be lost sooner or later. So Petrosian shuffles across. You can see that with c4, this forces weaknesses on the queen side. All these pawns are weak. And Fisher somehow has to organize a breakthrough without allowing counterplay. So he doesn't invade straight away with the rook, which could allow something like this. Instead, he plays f3. So that not only stops this knight going into e4, but also just prepares to bring the king into the game. Now, this is important for a couple of reasons. One, it's usually good to give the king some room in the end game, and it brings it nearer to the center. And specifically, that's important because the king later on can protect this pawn, and that's one, why it's one weakness in the position. It can be hit by the rook. And well, I'll show you a variation later where this is important. Well, in fact, right here. So what about rook? c8 to contest the c file. Well, in this case, rook c2, rooks are exchanged on c2, and rook b4. So here's a crunch moment. Should white plunge in and allow counterplay? Well, definitely not, because the rook can come here and the d-pawn's dangerous. But instead, just for a moment, white plays modestly. It protects the pawn. This knight can't do anything. And then the king will step up here, protect the d-pawn, and then the rook is free to invade on the c-file. The great thing about, well, from white's point of view, is that these pawns are chronically weak. You can see black simply cannot improve the situation of those pawns. They're all isolated, and at some moment, white is going to invade and pick one of the, at least one of them off. So instead of playing rook c8, Petrosian decided to try and get some counterplay on the king's side. Fisher invaded. The knight came in, threatening the rook. Knight f4, so rook d2. And now, instead of defending passively, Petrosian decides to make a break for it. He thinks his only chance is to try to attack the king. And he's probably right. I think defending passively ultimately would lead to defeat. So he gives a pawn and goes for white's king. But Fisher, well, his technique was brilliant. And what's the secret of good technique? Good calculation. Basically, he has calculated that his king simply is not in danger here. Although it looks slightly odd to step up the board, in fact, black has no chance of attacking it properly. And Fisher realizes that he can just pick off these pawns. Now, Petrosian is fighting hard. He's trying to get these rooks into the game. Two rooks and a knight, but this is actually so long-winded. Fisher is three pawns up, and now he switches the knight over, just making sure there isn't any trouble. This rook does a very good job, by the way, protecting this pawn <clears throat> and also supporting this one. King here, still no danger. Knight goes back, and the rook comes over. Obviously, exchanging pieces is going to help white. There really will be no attack in that case. Um, F5 check. King is still safe. It's no danger. You can always find a way out. And now knight e4. Well, that's important. We'll see in a moment why. 
because finally in this position black might actually be threatening something finally he might be about to step up with the king and go for a checkmate but because this knight has just hopped over Fisher can just eliminate all danger by this sacrifice and it also allows him to exchange pieces as well now what's the score Fisher has five pawns for the knight that's good enough but this rook wow what a strong piece it just played a defensive role in this game but a really important role you know the rest of Fisher's pieces basically went on the rampage the rook took the pawns the king is actually now in a wonderful position threatening to take here and here Petrosian went in for an exchange of rooks well in fact white is threatening just to push and it really is hopeless um, you know another pawn would drop and then white could edge forward on the king side for example very steadily but Petrosian played here and Fisher saw no reason to decline and a check and he didn't even bother taking this he just played king e5 and knight takes now it's only four pawns for the for the knight and here Petrosian resigned the knight is going to have to come back to stop the a pawn and then this can be taken and white can choose how he wins you can either move the king back to attack the knight or you could be really cruel and just edge forward with the three pawns on the king's side. Um, you can, it's completely winning. Here, yeah, Petrosian resigned. Wow. So that was four games in a row that Fisher won against Petrosian. I mean, what, in the end, what a crush. Spassky said something very interesting immediately after the match was over, actually. He said, I must say in all sincerity that Fisher performed splendidly. His play leaves a very good, pleasant impression. Whereas in the first half of the match, we saw Petrosian, but did not see Fisher at all. Closer to the finishing line, we saw only Fisher. Petrosian was not visible at all. It seems to me that the main reason for Petrosian's lack of success in the second half of the match was the fact that he lacked the determination to wage an uncompromising struggle. Or perhaps he'd even somewhat lost the taste for it. Well, I think Spassky has hit the nail on the head there. It's very perceptive. Because if we look back to game six, the first game, well, the first game of this run of four that Petrosian, uh, that Fisher won, Petrosian played this odd move b3 in the opening allowing Fisher to take the center and it's as though Petrosian was ducking a fight in the sort of main line of, with using d4 and then this Sicilian end game where Fisher played knight takes d7 again Petrosian's opening wasn't great you know it allowed Fisher sort of very easy play and in these last two games, the, the semi tarish that Fisher played, um, Petrosian basically ducked out of the critical continuation in the opening. And in this final game, okay, the match was as good as over. Um, but really to allow this kind of position where Fisher, I think is in his element in these very clear strategical positions, think it's a mistake so there we go match over Fisher won uh, by a four point margin after nine games um, at the closing ceremony this is Baturinsky who's the head of Petrosian's delegation at the closing ceremony both competitors made brief speeches Petrosian said this was a well-deserved victory for his opponent Fisher thanked his opponent for his gentlemanly behavior well that's nice of Fisher and nice of Petrosian as well. So this is our road to Reykjavik is pretty much over. Fisher was just dominant in 1970 and 1971. He 
dominated the interzonal tournament in 1970. He crushed Taimanov and then Larson by 6 0 in both matches. And then finally, he crushed Petrosian here after a somewhat shaky start, but in the end, totally convincing. Fisher really was at the peak of his powers in these years. And then we come on to 1972. I will at some moment turn back to that, but I think I'm going to leave this topic for some time um, and turn to other things. But anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the road to Reykjavik and um, do check out, well, the whole series. And uh, if you want to like, comment, share and subscribe, please do. And remember, if you'd like to support us on the Powerplay Chess channel, then do click on the links to PayPal or Patreon.com and enjoy the rewards, extra videos, for example. Do check them out. Thanks for watching.